Okay. Gotta love technology. So I'm working on uh, working on a borrowed laptop here. Thanks very much, guys. So uh, a couple of things might just be funky, and I might uh, might be struggling a little bit, but we'll get through it. So uh, my name is Tom Auger, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, advanced post queries. Uh, if you've read the description of my talk, I'm trying to do two things at once. So it's a bit of an experiment. We'll see how it goes. Um, I wanted, I wanted to deliver a talk that could help people that are just starting out developing WordPress, customizing it, theme developing, whatever, um, to sort of better utilize the tools that WordPress offers to us. And then I wanted to add a little bit in the end for those of you that have been doing it for a while and have some experience and maybe want a couple of pro tips. Um, so the front end is going to be sort of a little light for some of you. And the back end might be a little heavy for some of you, so we'll see how it goes. And actually, it'd be helpful to me to find out how many of you consider yourself beginners. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's, that's excellent, actually. Well, let's just get started. <laughs> I'll just skip the first half of my presentation altogether. Okay, so the topic is um, advanced post queries. And really the topic of, the, of my talk is the database. Uh, post queries, of course, being uh, one way of accessing the database. And so I really want to talk to you and get you sort of understanding the whole realm of the database, but we're going to specifically focus on posts. And there's all kinds of content that falls under the category of posts. But just for a minute to talk about what's in the database, basically almost everything in WordPress is actually in the database. Your posts, your pages, uh, attachments, revisions, nav menus, all kinds of things like that. And then even your users are stored in there, your site options, your roles, everything is in the database. So it becomes really important for us to learn how to interact with the database. Um, for those of you that may be following a similar path as me, I was a developer before I discovered WordPress for many years. And so when I first opened up WordPress and said, okay, let's, let's customize this baby, I immediately went to what I was comfortable with, which was you know, accessing the database directly, working with MySQL, and just you know, hand coding everything. And to be perfectly honest, my first couple of WordPress sites were a complete disaster. Uh, they launched and they ran and they did their job, but when I come back now, two, three years later, to maintain them, first of all, I shudder, because it's just so ugly the way I did things, but it also breaks periodically as WordPress updates and they modify the schema of the database or new features come out. And so I, I'm having a lot of trouble maintaining some of those older sites because I was going in at too low of a level. So actually, in, when it comes to WordPress development, staying as high level as possible, which also benefits us because it means it's also simpler because WordPress, the APIs tend to abstract a lot of that stuff for us and save us from having to go in there and write exhaustive queries. So it actually helps to stay up level. So when we talk about post queries, I'm really talking about how do we get the content out of your database and onto the page. And WordPress does a lot of this stuff automatically. Um, what was really interesting to me as I was just kind of researching to round off this talk was just how much WordPress does without us having to program anything. So if I have a site that's up and I want to uh, see all of the posts that were done in a certain month, well, there's a URL a string that I can just type in. So I've got an example over here of date. And you can just type in slash year. And if you want, you can type in slash month right into the URL. And WordPress automatically recognizes that through its rewrite rules, goes in, writes the query, generates the SQL, accesses the database, and then displays your content that you've requested for that month and that year on the appropriate template page. And all that's done for you without a line of code. So if you're sitting there and you've got a client project and the client wants to have, for example, monthly archives, or wants to be able to list all the posts by a certain author. Let's say they've got three or four bloggers that are each posting and they want to be able to have a profile page, maybe a bio page of the author, and then you click on a link and you want to see all of their posts. That's already in there. And for that, all you have to do is type in slash author, slash, and then the, the nice name of the author. That's the one with lowercase and the dashes in it. And you'll automatically get that archive. And then if you've gone and configured your theme appropriately, you could even have a, 
an, ar uh, an author archive template that specifically adjusts its HTML output or its style sheets to accommodate that particular type of content. So before you start thinking, oh, I've just learned all these great new post query techniques from Tom, I'm gonna now start using that. Ask yourself first, can I do this at the highest level of WordPress, which is right there within the URL? Another, actually, another interesting one, oh, and I should probably point out, how do you use this? So obviously your users can just type that in, but if you wanted to provide, say, a button on your page that says, see all posts by this author, you can just code the URL into the button and just add, you know, slash author, slash author nice name, whatever the author nice name is, right there into your button, and when they click that, that's going to generate the link. So you have a way of kind of creating links to these pages. You can also do that in your nav menus. When you go and customize a nav menu, you can use a custom page type, and or sorry, a custom URL, and you can actually type in uh, whatever arbitrary URL you want, and including ones that are uh, on your own site, and so that could be a nav menu item, and you can see see all posts by Tom as a nav menu item. When they click on it, it generates that URL. So you don't even have to actually go the route of of coding a customized page for that. Question. These are assuming we have set. Thank you. Yes, that's. Uh, so the question was, do we have to have permalink set up, or is it, we're assuming that? And yes, and I th thanks for pointing that out. In WordPress, you go to your admin back end, you go to settings, and then you go to permalinks, and you, you choose which is now the default permalink for, mo for the new WordPress install since I think it's 3.4 and the massive revisions that they've done to the rewrite module, and uh, you just make sure that's set to post name, and you hit save, and then WordPress will generate uh, the, cor the corresponding HT access file, and that will allow all of this rewrite stuff to work. If you're not running permalinks, you're actually, um, you're kind of crippling WordPress a little bit, so it's really highly recommend that you do, and it's set up by default. You just have to remember, once you've installed your site, to go into settings, permalinks, and usually all you have to do is just hit the save button or the update button, and it flushes the permalinks, and away you go. Particularly if you're interested in search engine optimization, you really want to make sure you have permalinks on because URLs that like P equals 253 aren't particularly helpful and Google tends to frown at that. Whereas if you have a link that says custom post queries and, that, and that's the content of your page, it really ranks highly. All right. So let's say that we've determined that of this list of, of options that I provided, there's, nothing, there's no URL or there's, there's no rewrite rule that will correspond to the kind of query that I want. So now we're looking at doing a little bit of coding after all. And there are a number of uh, functions that WordPress exposes to us developers to be able to do this. Um, query posts is the first one that I'll discuss. It's a little bit of a black sheep these days and I'll explain to you why it's kind of disfavored and what conditions we want to be able to use it in and not use it. Everything is powered by the WP query class and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then if you specifically want to get a list of posts or a list of pages, they've got, um, they've got specific functions for that which are really just nothing more than shortcuts which default a bunch of defaults that actually then queries WP query. So let's take a look first of all uh, of, well, where it goes. So we talked about the URLs, now we're talking about creating kind of custom pages in, in a sense and figuring out where do we put this code that I'm going to be showing you. Um, and there's a number of different strategies here. Uh, so most often, and I think a lot of the cases we'll be talking about today, most often they would go, you would create a template, uh, PHP template in your theme, maybe you're working with a child theme, maybe you're customizing a theme, and you would put the code right in there, in the PHP there, so that that PHP code executes specifically when the requested page launches. Um, I don't really have the scope in this talk to talk about page templates and how to figure out which one, which one there is. Um, you should definitely, if this is still fairly new to you, definitely go back to the codex and just type in uh, page template hierarchy or template hierarchy. Um, suffice to say, the easiest, probably the easiest way to get up and getting some of these custom queries working is to go into your admin backend to create a new page. You can call it whatever you want. And then, so let's say I call the page test because I'm being really creative this morning. Uh, 
So if you go into your theme directory now and you create a, page, uh, you create a PHP file called page dash, and then the slug, in this case my example it's test, so if I have page dash test.php, that template is going to be automatically loaded whenever the, uh, somebody requests that particular page. So that's the perfect place to put code specifically to appear on that page and only on that page. There are a number of other strategies that we can use, but that's by far the easiest one to get up and running with. If you're defining, if you're creating your own widgets, whether you're doing it in a theme or you're creating a plugin that's going to add a new widget for users, in the widget code would be another area where you would use these queries. And then we're going to talk a little bit later on about hooks, and Yannick did a great job of sort of introducing that in the last year as well. Um, the, some of these things that I'm going to show you can only be done in the context of an action hook. And so you would define your hooks somewhere along the line in your code. Often people just start use functions.php, which is loaded with every page load, and then they register their hooks. And then maybe you use a separate file to actually define the callback code for those hooks. But you can do this all within your functions.php. So two really easy ways to get started with this stuff. One is to create a a custom page and then create a custom page template and put your PHP in there. Another one is in your themes functions.php file, you can use the hooks that I'm going to describe and then you can write your functions directly in there. And then as you start getting into more complex deployments and larger systems, you'll probably want to wrap these things in your own classes and use uh, includes or require once is a great way and then have a subdirectory where you put in all of your stuff. And if you've inspected any of the themes, uh, a lot of the themes you can get on wordpress.org and indeed a lot of the plugins that you download if you've ever looked at their code, you'll see it's not usually just one functions.php file and a style.css. There's usually a host of other files that are included there. And so that's another great way, if you're getting into a bit more of an advanced scenario, to do that. Okay, so the first and easiest way, and what most, many of us had did in, you know, when we were first learning about creating our own custom queries in WordPress, was to use query posts. Uh, it's very easy, it's, um, it's quite clear what it does, it's quite easy to understand where you use it, and it's also quite heavily documented on the codex, so it's usually one of the first places that people go, and it's usually one of the first functions they use for queries. Um, so there's two ways of working, of interacting with query posts. In fact, there's two ways of interacting with the WP query object. Uh, one, I call it old school, which has this URL string, which of course, nice color scheme choice, you can hardly even see it. But you can see that we use query posts, and then I've got an, uh, I've got a quote, and then I have just a string of key value pairs. So in this case, I'll read it out. It's cat equals six, ampersand post underscore type equals product, ampersand number posts equals five. So this is also can be very easy for people that are first beginning uh, to develop in WordPress because it looks just like a URL string. And if you've done any PHP programming, a lot of your code might have generated strings like this to then power the next, uh, the next session when someone clicks a link to tell uh, PHP or your PHP application what to do next. Um, it is a little bit hard to read, and so I'm in, I prefer the more modern format, uh, which this is going to be. Can you guys sort of see that, more or less? It's not, uh, and that's not ideal. Okay. Um, so the modern format, I've got the exact same query here, but this time I'm using an array. Uh, if you look up WP query on the codex or query post, you're going to see a bit more documentation on this. So everything that I say, also this is going to be posted, this, this presentation will be posted, and then you can also visit my blog for further information and, and code examples. But um, I'll just sort of walk you through what we see here. We see query posts, and then what we're passing to query post is not a string, but is in fact an array of key value pairs, and that makes it really easy to understand what we're customizing here. So in this case, we are, we, it's the same things, the category, we're passing a category ID. We want to get a list of custom post types, so I put the post type there, uh, and then uh, I'm customizing how many posts I put on the page. So there's a bit more brackets and a bit more getting used to, but once you get used to it, it actually is much more elegant, makes your code easier to read. Uh, a note, you'll also see in a lot of documentation or um, if you open up a plugin, people will sort of split this out into two steps. They'll first define the args in a variable. 
So they'll say, you know, dollar sign args equals array, and then exactly what you see here. And then they'll just say query posts args, and they'll put the args in there. Um, I tend to not do that. It's a little bit unnecessary. I find that in terms of legibility, making things easy to read, this is just as easy. There is a good time when it, to, to, to pull things out into a variable, and that's when you're writing a plugin or something that has uh, default values, and you want to be able to use uh, parse parse, WP parse args to be able to put those things together, but there's no need for that here. So I just tend to go for cleanliness. It also saves us a tiny little bit of PHP memory um, by not assigning it to a variable. So and it, it just makes the code a little bit easier to read in my opinion. Okay, so at this point in the presentation, I switch to my XAMP server and I show you a bunch of example sites that I've prepared painstakingly over the last few days, uh, but my laptop's sitting over there in shame in a bag and so we're just gonna have to visualize these things. So uh, I can't do some of the demonstrations, the live demonstrations, which might actually be a good thing because my experience is anytime you do a live demonstration in a speaking setting, it blows up in your face anyway and you look like you've never coded WordPress before. So this may actually save me. Uh, I can just blame technology instead of you know, <laughs> my own ignorance, which is a good strategy. Okay, so um, what can we query? And as I mentioned before, if you just pop into the codex, so I'm gonna try my very first bit of technological wizardry. I'm going to click a link and let's see what happens. Yes. Okay, so I just clicked the link to the codex and this is, this is your Bible. This has been my Bible. I keep coming back to this I've been you know, writing WordPress for quite a while and I still keep coming back to this because there's always those little things that you forget. And those little idiosyncrasies like when you define month, it's month num, not month. You know, little things like that that are always helpful. This page on the codex, I strongly recommend that this becomes your Bible uh, if you want to start exploring more about queries. And what's, once you get through all this sort of formal stuff, you got to scroll down a little bit you get into the parameters section. And this is where all the good stuff is contained. And to be helpful, they've got, you can see here in the sidebar, it says parameters and it lists all the different kinds of parameters that are available to you. So you just have to say, okay, you know what? I'm interested in changing the order of things. I'm gonna to go to the order by parameters and I click on that. And then it gives you a list of all the different parameters that you can pass to manipulate, in this case, the order of your, of your output. All right, switching back. Yes. So some of the things that we can query uh, are, we can query posts based on author. Um, we can query posts based on multiple authors or intersection of authors. Uh, we can definitely query on categories, tags, or your own custom taxonomies that you might put together. Um, so you can, and you can do multiple joins on those kinds of things. So you can say, I want all, let's say we're doing a video database. Um, which is sitting over there in shame. Uh, let's say we do a video database and we wanna see all the movies that have thriller as their theme and also science fiction. And so uh, you can put those, that query together without any SQL. Uh, obviously you can query on your post slug, your post name, uh, on the post IDs. You can query on the page parent. This is really great for subqueries when you're writing, for example, um, a page, uh, an article, um, and then you want to have maybe subsections to that article and you do that on different pages and you just, in WordPress, in the WordPress admin, you just choose the page parent when you're editing that page. You hit update. Now it knows that the, the main article was just a parent of these sub-articles and then in the template, maybe you want to output either the links to those, those child pages or maybe even the excerpts of those child pages underneath that you can click on to read more. So getting, being able to access the page parent is very, very useful for doing those kinds of hierarchical uh, posts. You can query on post type. Uh, this includes the default post types of post and page, things like that, but also your custom post types if you start getting into custom post types. Your post status, date and time. And then you can also do all your meta. You can put query on whether something is a sticky post or not. So you can have a page which only displays stickies or doesn't display any of the stickies. Um, you can, of course, add your pagination. So you show five, uh, five records and then you hit the next tab and then you show five more. Uh, then you can play with the sort order. That can be really interesting. Um, you can even change the sort order based on the number of comments. This is like the most popular posts. So you could have a page where you display the posts that have the most number of comments. And that's again, something that's very easy to do within the query. And then you can even create a random sort order. So if you set your total number of posts displayed to one, 
and then you set the sort order to random, you're gonna get a random post every time. This is great for doing random quotations or the post of the day or tip of the day, that kind of thing. And you can do that right in your page or maybe you're gonna write a widget to do that and have that in your sidebar. So here's an example. We're gonna get into just a tiny little bit of code to just sort of illustrate what I was talking about. Um, and we would be doing this in my XAMPP server, but let's just try to visualize. So what we would do is we'd go into the admin backend, we'd create a new page. You can title that page whatever you want. Really, at the end of the day, for this example, only the slug that's generated based on that title is important to what we're doing. Because when we're, go I'm gonna use the query post as an example. Typically, when you use query posts, that completely clobbers anything that would have been on that page because we're basically hijacking that page and repurposing it for our own query. Even though we got to that page because of some other query, namely, I typed in my address bar, you know, the name of my blog slash, and then the name of my page. I want to see that page. The query that gets generated to show me that page and to show me the content that might be on that page, including the title of the page, gets completely replaced by uh, query posts. So we create this page in the admin backend and we make a note of what that slug is, as I mentioned before. You can just hit the edit button and then you can highlight that and copy it to your clipboard buffer. And then you can go into your favorite IDE, such as NetBeans. Hopefully you'll be at Jer's talk because it's a fantastic tool. Uh, you go into uh, your IDE, you create a new PHP file in your theme directory called page dash and then the slug. And then you open that up and you can basically run that any way you want. Um, what I'll typically do is I'll go into my, if I'm doing a child theme, I'll go into my parent theme. I'll steal the code that it uses in page.php or single.php. I'll copy that and I'll paste that into my new empty PHP file. So I've got something to start with. So I'm not writing all that code myself and to also maintain consistency from page to page. So you just copy and paste it in there. And then at the very top, right after your opening PHP tag, even if you want, you can then run your query posts. The earlier you do it, probably the better because all of that other PHP that you just copied and pasted out of, you know, your parent, parent themes page.php, all of that stuff is meant, is expecting to be working on the query that you want to display, the title and all that stuff. So the earlier you can get query posts in this scenario, the better. So here is a very simple example. I'll read it out because it's a little dark to see. So at the top of my page, I'm going to have my opening PHP tag, maybe a little comment, and then we'll get into query posts, bracket array, bracket, and then in this case, order by, and then I've got my uh, deref my arrow, and rand. So that's going to set my, or my sort order to random, and then post per page equals one. So that's going to display just one post. And I even have a nice link that's not going to work at this point. But you trust me, it would have shown a random video from the database. One of the other common use cases that I see a lot, not necessarily a good use case, but one that I see a lot is to use query posts simply to limit the page count. So let's say that you're, you've got your, your home page and it always displays the 10 most recent posts and your client's saying, that's too many posts for my page. It's, break, it's making my layout look too cluttered. I just want to show five. And so what a lot of people will do is they'll uh, create a brand new query posts in one of the templates that gets loaded every time, and they'll say, you know, simply posts per page equals 20 or equals five or whatever in order to change that. And that will, in fact, change the number of posts that are displayed per page. But this is not great because query posts actually is going to load all of those pages twice. It will load them all the first time with the default query that WordPress got you uh, automatically and it'll say, let's say it loads those first 10 pages and then it hits your query post and it says, oh, okay, he wants five and it's not just going to take the five, that, uh, five, the first five of those 10, it's going to initiate a brand new query on the database, execute a whole boatload of PHP code and then come back and spit out the results. So don't, don't do that if you can avoid it. And in fact, if all you wanted to do was change the number of posts that are displayed, well, there's an settings for that in the admin backend, which most of you probably already know. You go into settings, reading, and then there's a little field that says blog pages show at most, and the default is usually 10 on a fresh install of WordPress, and you can just change that. Now, that will affect all of the pages of the site, so you kind of have to manage that a little bit, but if all you were doing was just trying to limit the number of posts, then uh, there's probably a better way of doing it. So, Query post is getting a bad rap and probably rightly so. And if you look up the codex entry for query posts, um, let's do that just so I can feel a little bit empowered here. 
Uh, and I'll just read this. Uh, query post is the easiest but not preferred or most efficient way to alter the default query that WordPress uses to display posts. So it's in the codex. Okay, now, mind you, I think I wrote that line. But um, it, is, it is official. And um, oh, see, now here we go. Now we're, things are starting to screw up. Okay, phew. Um, so let's just talk about why query posts gets this bad rap. So first of all, query post is not as versatile as some of the other messages we're going to look at. So it's only useful, for example, to alter the main loop. And it will clobber whatever was already there, and that's how it's supposed to be used. So it's used, you call query post before you get into you know, the loop, and it, that will set up all the records for you. But it can't be used for a subquery that you might want to have after that. It can, without additional effort, break pagination because often uh, when you click the pagination link to go to the next series of posts, the, next, the, the, the pagination was actually defined by the default query, not by the query posts that you just put. Now, this can be fixed with a bit of effort, but it's, some, it's a big gotcha for a lot of people. And I guess for me anyway, because I'm, we're dealing with lack of efficiency, it still executes the original query. Now, that might not be a problem on some sites, but on some sites that are really intensive, that have a huge database, or that have a lot of processing that goes on, or the query itself that you're asking for is quite complex, that could actually invoke a lot of calls and slow down the processor, because it's actually uselessly fetching a bunch of records, which it's then going to completely ignore as query post goes in there and replaces it. Andrew Nason's got a great talk, which he delivered in the Netherlands this year, um, called You Don't Know Query. I suggest you look that one up, You Don't Know Query. It's on SlideShare. And uh, he talks about this, and he mentions that every time you query the database, there's actually up to four queries that actually happen. Um, it's not just going to query your records, it's going to get the count and a bunch of other, it's going to get your metadata, it's going to get your taxonomy stuff. So it actually hits the database a number of times and that can really cause some serious load on your system. So uh, let's try to use query posts sparingly. We definitely can't use it in a subquery. Subqueries are a really great part of theme development in particular or, and especially plugin development, uh, if you're creating widgets and whatnot, you're always going to be creating subqueries because your main query is powering the content of your page, and now you're just adding additional content in your sidebar. So by definition, that's a subquery. So you can, all kinds of cool things you can do, even in, within the main page body, you can show your listing of your page as normal, and then you can write a subquery that gets a secondary query that gets executed against the database to do things like show related posts, for example. A very easy technique if you use tags whenever you create a page or whenever you create a post and you enter in a bunch of tags. Um, if you write a subquery that looks at the tags of the current page and tries to find all the other pages in the database that have those tags and then sort by the maximum number of tags that are found, uh, you can get a, a pretty decent related posts kind of feeling because you're going to have a, a list of posts that have the same tags or as many, that share the same tags with the post that you just, that you just listed. So you can use subqueries for that kind of thing. You can use subqueries I mentioned to add child pages. You have a main article and then a bunch of other related articles that are associated in the admin back end as children of the other page, and you can do that with a subquery. Um, if you have a page that has a lot of different things on it, like a lot of landing pages tend to have quite a bit on it. Let's see. Let's take my life in my own hands here and just Okay, hold on. Bear with me here. We're going to go to itstimenow.ca as just as an example. Okay, so here's an example of a page that has a lot of content on it. Some might argue it's a little busy. Frankly, I kind of feel ill when I look at this page. Um, but the actual, the main post, the main article of this page, so the, when, you, when you go into the admin back end and you edit this page, the content, the only content is just that little what's at stake section over there to the left, uh, to the right of the video. That's actually the main page content. All this other stuff is subqueries that are being generated to add things like news, upcoming events, and then frequently add questions, asked questions, which is another custom post type that we define for the site, and so on. So these are all reasons or use cases for working with subqueries. Before you get into 
dig, digging deep into writing custom subqueries, ask yourself if there's not a template tag for that. Often we think we need to create a subquery. For example, a common one is I, need to, I want to list all the categories that are associated with this page uh, or with this post. Uh, that sounds like I'm going to have to do a custom query and to do that. That stuff's already been loaded when uh, you executed the main query. You just need to get at it using template tags. So that's, um, there's template tags all over the place. And if we, I'm not going to click on the link because you've probably already been here. Almost everyone's already been here. You can go and check in the codex and see a listing of all the template tags. Um, so we can get like the author information um, by using the author, uh, which will give us the author's uh, username. Um, we can get, use the author meta, which is a great way of listing out the specific piece of metadata that we want for that author. Um, then we can get the post meta, and it will actually output that as a list if we want. It'll actually go through and iterate through each one of the post meta that's associated with my post and spit it out as a list. We can get our categories, our tags, our custom taxonomies. Uh, and you can even get navigation like next post and previous post. There's something called next post link and previous post link or pre previous post link that will actually output the links that you need uh, and including uh, the, whatever you want it to say as well to go back and forth and navigate within uh, your post structure. So there's template tags out there and I highly recommend before you get into uh, writing other queries that might be unnecessary, just see if there's not a template tag for it. When you get into subqueries, a good thing to remember is, am I iterating through a list of posts or am I just trying to, uh, trying to output a piece of data about the post? So if I want a list of new posts, that's a really great indicator that you want a subquery. So this is just an example of, uh, from the previous slide of using template tags. And here I've got my loop, and I've got the page that was, br was brought up. And then just before I close off the loop, I add a couple more divs, and I go and I grab some of the, some of the, uh, the template template tag. So I've got, I'm using the meta to list my post meta. I'm getting using the category, the underscore category, to get a list of the categories that belong to this post. It's a clickable list, so I can click on that, and that'll automatically take, to a new, take me to a new page, which then lists all the posts in that category. Same thing with the tags. And then you see an example here of uh, previous post link and next post link. So that stuff's real, real straightforward. OK, so now we're getting into the nitty gritty do I have a time check? Can someone just tell me? 11.30. Perfect. OK. All right, so now we're getting into the good stuff, um, which is WP query. WP query is the class. It's defined in wp include slash query.php, which is a really great place to spend your Sunday afternoon, trust me. Um, and you, uh, it powers all of the posts within, uh, sorry, powers all of the queries within uh, WordPress, basically. If you're using query post or if you're using any other method, it's all going through WP query. So that's, it's really important to understand WP query. If you want to create a subquery, and so we can't use query posts for a subquery. If we want to create a, your own subquery, we can get our own instance of WP query very easily by saying new WP query and then passing those args, that array of key value pairs that I showed you on the codex page that would allow us to actually generate our query and, and then WordPress spits out the appropriate SQL for that. So here's an example of WP query usage. So in my PHP file for that particular page, I first define, uh, I get an instance of WP query and I, I pass it the parameters that I want. Then I'm gonna call that my subquery. And then I create what looks a lot like the loop, but this time instead of using the post and have posts, I'm actually using the post method of my WP query instance to make sure that what the post that we're talking about is the one that my subquery generated, not the main query. So I'll just read out the while statement, while, and then we've got my subquery, which I've just defined earlier on here, my subquery, arrow, have posts. So the have posts part looks familiar to everybody because that's your main loop, but this time we're adding, a, we're adding the, the instance variable, of, or sorry, the instance of my WP query to it, and then we say my subquery arrow the post, and then it's done. After that, all kinds of magic happens, and then all of your template tags and so forth will work. So what that does is it basically tells WordPress, okay, we got to this page by using our main query, and now we're asking for a subquery, and we're gonna, every, this subquery is contained in this my subquery variable that I've created, 
But now I want to make that subquery kind of like temporarily the query so that all my template tags and whatnot work as expected. So within, so this is a secondary loop that I've created. It looks almost like the main loop. Within this secondary loop now, things like get template part, whatever, that's going to generate, uh, that's going to iterate through my posts and display the HTML specific to the content from my subquery, not from the main query. And so there's one important thing to remember here, and that's when you do that, you have to call WP reset post data at the end. And all that does is it says to WordPress, okay, I'm done hijacking sort of the template tags for my own subquery. I want to give them back to the main query so that if I have a page where I display my main query's content first, then I've got my subquery, and at the bottom I want to say, this page was created by Tom Auger. That is associated with the original post. So in order to make sure that when I say the author, I'm getting the author of the original post, not the author of the subquery's posts, I have to make sure I reset post data to do that. So it's very, very important to make sure you do that. And then we have some examples, which we're not going to go through. Okay. Um, one of the more complex aspects of WP Query I thought might be useful to talk about are meta queries and taxonomy queries because their syntax is a little bit odd, to be honest with you. And, the, and it's actually quite funky. Um, so I've got my new WP Query and then I define the array and the first key that I'm passing to the array, doesn't have to be first, but in this case, the key that I'm passing to the array is meta query and it gets an array of arrays. So the syntax looks kind of bizarre. Meta query, arrow, array, bracket, array, bracket, and then I get to do my stuff. And we'll show you why that's actually important. Actually, I was going to show you why in my live code. So that's, I'll have to just talk my way through it. Let's see, do we have a, no, we don't. Well, that's unfortunate. Okay, so within the meta query, codex, where are you, buddy? Hold on, let's just bring up the codex and go right there. We can. Take it from the horse's mouth. At least you can see some examples to talk me through. One moment, please. Uh, what am I looking for? Custom, custom, custom field parameters. Here we go. Okay, so here's an example of a meta query. Just coming down. Excellent. Okay, so in the middle of the page, we see a meta query uh, array bracket array, bracket, and now I'm going to say, I want to give me all the posts uh, where the meta key, where it has a meta key that's set to color, that's called color, where the color value is blue, and, or actually, it's the comp comparison is not like. So I want to find all the meta keys that have a color, but, or all the posts that have a meta value of color, but don't have, uh, sorry, let me say that again. All the posts that have custom field called color, that, ha that do not have the value of blue. So that's pretty simple and doesn't really justify the multiple bracket. But here we have, we want to say, okay, give me all the posts that aren't blue and whose price is between 20 and 100 bucks. Okay, so that's two, I'm, set, I'm querying on two different pieces of metadata. So I need basically two meta queries and, that, and each meta query is contained in its own array. So that's where the double array syntax now starts to make sense. I get a meta query is an array of meta queries. The first meta query deals with color. The second meta query deals with price. And then just to make matters even more complicated, if you want, by default, we're going to create an and union of those two. So I want all the posts whose color is blue. And of those posts whose color is blue, I only want the ones that are between 10, 20 and 100 bucks. So they've got to be blue and between 20 and 100 bucks. The or, which we see here as the or relation, so at the top we do our meta query and then the first thing we define is the relation between all of the other uh, meta queries inside there is going to be or and that would say give me all of the posts whose color is blue and, or, it sounds like and, but or give me the posts whose price is between 20 and $100. So I'm going to get all the blue posts, and then I'm going to get the red and the green posts whose price happens to be between 20 and $100. So that's where the or can be, can be used, it's a bit more powerful. Okay, so that explains why the syntax for meta queries, and the same thing is true for taxonomy queries, that explains why that syntax is a little bit funky. Taxonomy queries, we might want to say, uh, 
let's say I've got, I'm using two different categories, or I might want to say, show me, all of the, uh, show me all of the videos whose director is Quentin Tarantino, and so I've got a category of directors, a custom category, taxonomy of directors, and I've got a list of directors. Show me all of the, the films with Quentin Tarantino whose genre is action. Probably all of them. Okay, reset post data is really important. I talked about that, I can skip this slide. Uh, just remember, if you're gonna use uh, a, a subquery and you're going to take advantage of the post, if you don't use the post, you're fine. And for a while, I stayed away from using the post and I just always referenced uh, the subquery itself. It makes for it slightly harder to read code. And more importantly, it, it disallows you from using any of the template parts that might be defined in your theme. So, uh, because the template parts are meant to be work, to work with your template tags, uh, we need to make sure that those template tags are actually showing my subqueries posts, not the main queries posts. So if I want to take advantage of that stuff, it's better to just use the post. You just have to remember to reset the post data at the end. Okay, now we're getting into some more advanced stuff beyond writing custom queries. Now we want to start talking about, okay, we want to customize the way WordPress manipulates the main query. Um, so this is, this is where we're going to get into action hooks and, and, and a little bit more detailed stuff here. So we may want to modify the main query. We might want to modify the way all queries work site-wide. Let's say you're creating a very specific site. It's not a blog site. Maybe it's a, an e-commerce site and you're using WordPress as your back end and you're creating custom post types like product, for example. And let's say that you want always to make sure that all your products are going to be sorted by price no matter what. Okay, that's probably a stupid design decision to make, but let's just go with that one. So we want all of our products to be sorted by price no matter where they appear in any list, they're going to be sorted by price. We could always, we could write a bunch of, you know, query posts that make sure that the order is always set to price, or we can modify the way the main query, the way all queries work on the site, and they always will be sorted by post and we don't, or by price, and we don't have to think about it further. Or we might want to modify queries for a specific page. So I'm just going to switch over to a real life uh, example here that I can, I can walk through some reasons why we might want to uh, modify the main query. We're just going to look at Amovo, amovo.ca. All right, no. So this is this website here is for uh, a furniture company. Uh, actually, they're a furniture retailer, but they, they don't actually manufacture the furniture. They, mon they, uh, they, ha they host a lot of different manufacturers. But obviously, they're trying to sell furniture. So in addition to the standard posts, one of the things that we've, uh, we did was we wanted to create um, a product custom post type. So a lot of the information on this website deals with products. It made sense to create its own custom post type. Uh, which what that did for us was it first of all allowed us to be more specific in our queries but from the customer's perspective when they go to enter in a new product we were able to customize that admins page so that it would have it would you know they could upload the product image and then they could choose the categories and the keywords and they could select the manufacturer of that product and all that stuff so creating a custom post type allows you to sort of use WordPress more as a CMS, a content management system, than just as a blogging platform. And so I imagine many of you uh, are familiar with this. So everything in this site, really, the important stuff, all deals with project, uh, products, and products in this case, okay, no, franchement, uh, ne jamais traduire les pages. Sorry, I'm messing up your map, laptop. Okay, um, I forgot. Uh, this is not my laptop. That's how comfortable I am with it. Okay, so uh, here we've got a list of products by category. Um, it's actually a custom taxonomy, even though I called it category. It's not using the categories that are with, uh, default with WordPress. These are a, a new taxonomy called product-categories. And so if I click on you know, a particular category, like systems furniture, for example, um, we're going to get a list of all their products that are in that category. And if you look at the URL at the top of the screen, I'm not using any magical queries here. This is just a custom taxonomy query. It's supported by default with the WordPress rewrite rules. So the URL is amovo.ca slash product-categories, which is the slug of my custom tax, slash systems-furniture, which is the term, which is the actual category name. And then that, by default, tells WordPress, okay, uh, let's generate a list of all of the products that follow, actually, all of the posts, 
be they products or otherwise, all the posts that, autom that fall under this category, because this category was associated exclusively with the post custom post type, I don't have to worry beyond that because I'm not going to get other types of posts. I'm always only going to get products because only products are associated with that category. Okay, so as I've just set up a little bit about uh, the site. So the dilemma that came, and this is, you know, typical uh, runtime dilemma that you get from customers, is after we built this site, they said, this is really great, but you know what? We forgot to mention, um, we want to be able to promote certain products or certain manufacturers. And when they visit, when the manufacturer comes to visit our site, we want to make sure that they see their products near the top of the list. Uh, because these are the guys that we're really trying to impress. And so, uh, is there any way that we can just make sure that whenever we list products, that the products for those manufacturers kind of get bumped up to the top of the list? So we thought about it a little while. There was a number of design, uh, uh, design options that we could have taken. The one that we ended up adopting because it proved to be the most flexible for the, how the client wanted to interact with it was to create a, a custom piece of post meta called Priority. And so when they're editing the post for that particular product, they go and they edit the product, they got a little pull-down menu that allows them to choose the priority. And the higher the priority, the, obviously the higher it goes on the list. So that's great. But then we were looking at all the different pages that we created for the site that need to sort by product and became a daunting task because it was just that is a sort of a ubiquitous thing throughout. So what we wanted to do instead was we wanted to go in and actually modify the way WordPress queries any product to include this particular sort uh, criteria of sorting on this particular post meta. So we couldn't do that by using the query interface or the query API. We had to go lower level than that. Okay, so uh, yes. Okay, so this is where we are now. Okay, so the first thing we did was in I'm gonna I'm gonna simplify by calling it functions.php, but it's actually a subclass deep inside the folder structure. Um, we're gonna define a we're gonna use one of the filters, and I'll talk about these filters uh, a little bit later on. Um, so first thing we want to do is we want to hook onto one of these filters, and the, the filter that we chose for this case was the posts underscore clauses filter. This is a fantastic filter. It's my favorite. It actually it's done. Just before the SQL is sent to the database, you get a chance to see all the SQL that WordPress has automatically generated for you, and you get to mess with it. And you get to, um, it, it's broken out by different clauses, so you got your where clause, your select clause, your from clause, your join clause, your order by clause, your limits clause. So you got all these great clauses that you can work with, and you can add your own SQL to the end of it, or you can replace it, five minutes, great. So I'm gonna talk really fast. Um, so, so what you do is uh, anywhere in your code that you know is going to execute at the right time, and here I've put it in within a not is admin, I hook into posts clauses with my function name. And then my function name is actually, my function is pretty simple. Uh, it receives, because we're hooking into posts clauses, it receives two things. It receives the list of clauses that I just talked to you about, and then it actually also receives an additional piece of information, which is the original WP query object, which contains all the information that WordPress has stored about your particular query. So the first thing that we do then is uh, we want to make sure when you do this kind of thing, it's going to by default affect every query in your database, or sorry, in your site, okay? When we hook into post clauses or anything else like that, it's going to affect every query that runs through your site, even widgets and plugins and authors and stuff like that. So you want to really make sure that you limit what I can affect here. So you have to come up with a test, some kind of test that's really only going to work for the, 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 the particular query you want to change. In our case, we've, we discovered that we only list products by category or by another category called product application, or two taxonomies. So all we have to do is in our, uh, in our function that's getting called by this particular hook, we get past the clauses and we get the query. And the query contains this wonderful property called query vars. And those are the actual query vars that were used to build the original SQL. The SQL that I'm in the process of manipulating. The reason why I have that SQL is because of these query vars. And all those query vars are stored inside this, the, the query vars property of my query. So I can inspect that and say, look, I'm really only interested in queries that are targeting uh, these particular taxonomies, product-category and product-application. So I just put that in an if statement, and then I do all my code, all of my manipulation within that if statement. And the only thing that has to be outside of that if statement is this filter 
needs you to return the clauses. It's expecting to get the clauses back. If you forget to do a return clauses at the end of this function, you generate no SQL. And that really kind of tends to break sites quite a bit. So uh, make sure that you know when you're using this function, this filter, you always return your clauses. You don't have to return query. That's additional information. But always the first parameter of your filters need to be returned, as you probably know. So just to show you, um, oh yes, OK. So I can't actually show you further on in the code. So what happens when you're working with, um, when you're working with the post clauses is you get an array of all the different clauses, the where clause, the join clause, and so forth. So in order to be able to sort on priority, remember that we created this piece of post meta called priority. So, and, and the, there's a value, and that's the value we want to sort on. So we need to actually interact with the query in two different places. We obviously want to affect the sort order. So we're going to affect the order by clause. But we're ordering by something that wasn't, that's not necessarily available at that time to my SQL query, which is that particular piece of post meta. meta. So I need to also join on post meta as well. So I'm modifying the join clause and the order by clause. And it's very simple to do because these clauses are just strings, text, you read it, and it looks like the SQL you would normally type into your SQL client. And you could just add your own stuff to the end of it. So you could just say space, join, WP post meta on, you know, and then the post ID and the meta key, in this case priority, and, and so on. Now you can reference that in your order by clause and now you have access to the value and you can just simply say order by meta value and away you go. So um, to conclude this, I want to just reemphasize something about making sure that it's the right query. So when you, when you affect, uh, when you use these kinds of hooks, and actually maybe I should just skip ahead real quick. Here, I just want to talk about four hooks and I think we're going to be done and then we can just wrap up. Um, so the, 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 one of the hooks that I talked about was post clauses. That's the third one down here. But we actually have four, actually more than four, we have a number of key opportunities within the uh, delivery of our page to inject our own code. So when somebody types a URL into the browser and it, and it gets that WordPress uh, runs, WordPress analyzes the URL and it generates uh, this, uh, this query based on what you've typed in the URL. So we can actually manipulate those query variables before the query even gets parsed. Before we even get to parsing the query and figuring out what the SQL is, we can go and manipulate it. So if we want everything to, um, we only want to be dealing with posts that are marked private, for example, we can add that up there at, as our query variable. We don't have to write any SQL because WordPress already generates SQL for that. So that's the request filter. So you add filter request, and then you get the, the query object, and you can manipulate that before WordPress even processes it further, just after it's analyzed your query string. Before the SQL is generated, you have another opportunity to mo modify the query, and that is the parse query. And there's also pre-get posts. And if you look at, if you follow the code, they're actually three lines apart or two lines apart. So they actually get executed almost simultaneously, and there's really no difference. It's a matter of choice which one you use. Most most examples you'll see online use pre-get posts, so might as well stick with that. You can use that filter, and that again gives you access to the query ob uh, object before any SQL is generated. Then we get my favorite, which is post clauses, which gives you all the clauses, and you just have to modify that and send it back, and now you've got new or added SQL. And if you want to, for whatever reason, after the SQL has hit the database and returned the results, you get the opportunity to, to manipulate the results before they end up getting output to your page. And that's using posts results filter. So these four filters are extraordinarily powerful in manipulating the query. We just want to make sure that we're affecting the right query. So a couple of strategies to use when you're doing this. If you know that this query is only going to be, you want it only to modify the admin side, or conversely, you only want it to auto modify the front end and not affect the admin, you can put the actual registration of the filter hook within an is admin uh, conditional, right? So we say if is admin, and then I can say uh, add filter whatever, parse clauses, post clauses. So that will only affect the admin side or only affect the front end side. So that's already a useful way of limiting things. Um, we have this new, I think it's 3.4, maybe 3.3, I can't remember whether they introduced it 
when they introduced it, but now we can work with is main 3.3. We can work with is main query within uh, our function that's handling uh, the manipulation. So we can say is main query, and that way we can sh be sure that we're not affecting any sidebar widgets or any subqueries. We're only going to affect the main query. Or conversely, if we wanted to, if we have, we're targeting a particular sidebar widget, we don't definitely don't want to affect the main query. We just say if not is main query. And then, as I mentioned in my example, we can get into the actual query vars and see if there's a query var that was done uh, for that. So let's say that we want to order by a particular field. We can look to see if, has the user asked for that order? And if they have, then, okay, then I'll manipulate the SQL. Otherwise, I'll just let it pass. So you can query on taxonomy, post type, order by, a whole bunch of stuff. Here's a very simple example. I want to manipulate the query that's going to affect one particular page of my site only. That page, uh, so I, that page, for whatever reason, I want it to behave a little bit differently. So in my function that's going to manipulate the SQL, I'll just say if query obs query vars page name. So I'm looking at if the page name is equal to page. In this case, I've got a fictitious page called page hijacking. If the page name is that, then manipulate the query. Otherwise, just let it pass on through. OK, I think we're probably out of time. Yes? Yes, most definitely out of time. Five Thanks. Minutes for Five minutes for questions. Let's take questions. I'm also going to be at the happiness bar pretty much right after this talk, so we can take it there. Yeah.